Thank you. Thanks, David. What an introduction. Um, so today we're, we're discussing the subject of artificial versus human. This is the broad frame for this debate, and we've got two really interesting speakers to talk about that with. Um, first, we've got Steve Fuller, who is a professor of sociology. He writes a lot about technology in this area. And we also have Zoltan Istvan, who is currently running for president, standing for the Transhumanist Party. So, Zoltan, I guess a good place to start is, um, very simply, what is transhumanism, and why would someone run for president based on this platform? Well, um, to begin with, transhumanism is a social movement of a few million people around the world. It's growing really quickly. It's a movement that wants to use science and technology to radically improve the human being and also to uh, modify the human experience. So it could be virtual reality, it could be a holographic reality, it could be any type of reality that's quite different than human beings, including becoming a machine and living in an artificial intelligence. But what's happening is, as everyone out there probably knows, if you're following the media, every single day there seems to be some type of new invention that is transforming how the human species is living. Um, and uh, it could be anything from brain implants to um, exoskeleton suits for the disabled, so no one's ever in a wheelchair. Uh, if you don't know, the blind uh, basically have uh, various types of uh, implants that now allow them to see through robotic eyes. So transhumanism is eliminating all sorts of uh, disabilities, all sorts of suffering, and it's an incredible platform to use as a, an aspiring politician because who doesn't want to have their lives made better through science and technology? So. A few years ago, when uh, transhumanism was starting to grow, I thought, well, how would be a good way to spread the message? And um, a really good way was during the elections to uh, create a transhumanist party and a transhumanist platform, which is what I've been running on. And um, it's uh, in the last two years I've been running, I had one of the longest campaigns started about 20 months ago. It's grown and grown. and. Uh, even recently, I was uh, surveyed as, I think, one of the third or fourth uh, leading uh, presidential candidate in terms of being a third-party candidate. So I have a good chance of ending up at number four, number five in votes in the American elections, which, uh, which is something to say for transhumanism because it's not that large of a movement. So I'm pretty excited about how far the, the movement and the field has come. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Steve. What are the potential problems with Zoltan's position? Well, first think? of all, let me start by saying that I'm largely sympathetic with the transhumanist position. So, so I don't come from this at a, at a purely adversarial perspective. Uh, but I do think one of the things that's been very interesting about Zoltan's campaign is that it is a campaign. It's a political campaign, and it's done the sort of things the political campaigns always need to do, which is to be clear about what the priorities are in terms of what the party stands for you know, what's first, what's second. And in fact, Zoltan has presented a Bill of Rights to the United States Capitol, uh, you know, saying, look, this should be the transhumanist Bill of Rights. Um, and, and the thing so, that's been- Sorry to interrupt, but just what, what would a transhumanist Bill of Rights involve? Well, what I mean, Zoltan kind of could talk about this in more detail, <laughs> but, 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 but I think the key, you know, the key thing, the, the first thing, and the thing that's been very much symbolic in terms of the way he's conducted this campaign, because he's basically been, uh, He's been basically traveling across the United States in a bus shaped like a coffin because um, the idea is that people should have the right to live forever, right? This is kind of the, this is the main plank of the platform. Um, and, and then if you look at the Bill of Rights, the most interesting, I think intellectually interesting and challenging notion is the idea of morphological freedom, which is a very much a transhumanist value. And it's the idea that you should have the right to live as you wish to live. And we can interpret this in a whole variety of ways. I mean, I, mean, I think we're most familiar with it in terms of things like transgender, but also it would include things like uh, being able to upload one's consciousness into machines and download oneself again and exist in multiple forms. And of course, to enhance one's body in a way through prosthetics or through, let's say, gene therapy or something like that, that it would enable you to potentially live forever you know, perhaps in your biological body, right? That all of these options, as it were, should be available to you as a basic human right. Uh, and, and, and that is a very challenging notion, I think, uh, not only for the political establishment, but I think for, for those of us who are thinking about how to fund this thing, okay? Uh, and, and so, 
this is one of the things that, in a sense, makes Zoltan very different from other transhumanists. In a sense, he puts his money where his mouth is, you might say. He actually says, okay, I'm standing for this, and this is what I'd actually like the United States Congress, I'd like governments to do, and so forth. And that's where the challenge comes about. It's not, it's not in the basic ideals, which I think a lot of us would agree with, but the challenges are, how do you make this real, and what would be the consequences, especially if there are people, for example, Zoltan never talks about this, the people who don't want to live forever. Right? The people who might think, you know, they want to take an early exit. Right? I mean, I mean, what happens then? And, 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 and lots of other things with regard to social structure, which are tied to the fact that people only live a limited amount of time. So the fact that we have generational change has often been one of the sources of radical ideas in society. But if you have the same old people living around forever in various forms, Basically, they monopolize the planet, and where will the, where will the incentive for new ideas, where will the source of new ideas come from? It seems that, you know, to give you just an example of what I'm talking about here, uh, last month I was in a debate at the Edinburgh Science Festival with Aubrey de Grey, who is very much a, um, an advocate for our ability to live forever by, by basically re-engineering our genes. And has a fantastic beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> yes, just like you. Um, and, and, and the thing was about him was uh, when, when somebody in the audience asked, well, what would these people be like, these people who lived forever, who actually went through this transformation? He said they would be like vintage cars. <laughs> that was his answer, and that wasn't meant ironically, okay? And, and, and this is the kind of world you're, you're potentially imagining, right? And in a sense, Zoltan, one of the great contributions of Zoltan to transhumanism is in a way to force us to think in a much more concrete way about what it would look like if we got what we really wished for. Zoltan, would you like to be a vintage car? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't I subscribe well, to so, the vintage. <laughs> so, I mean, but would you like, you would like to live forever as, as a principle? Yes, 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 100%. Yeah, that's the main and, goal. And Steve, you, you would like to live forever as well? I, yes, but I'm not sure I'd want to be a vintage car. I mean, this is the <laughs> thing. I mean, what does it look like? Well, I guess, I guess we could distinguish between yeah, yeah, the, yeah, no, the, 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 desire, the desire and the practicality. I mean, I, I'd like to poll the audience quickly on this. Um, could you stick your hands up if, if you were offered the option to live forever? I think it's important to say you wouldn't be immortal, so you would be able to be harmed. Uh, if, you, if you would like that, would you put your hands up, please? Quite a few. Quite, quite a few. few. Quite About a few. 50%. There's a, there's Maybe a, more than half. Yeah. So there's a lot of dyers out there, so, I well, guess we could call them. <laughs> uh, and, and it's surprising in this crowd, because you'd expect a bias toward immortality here. Well, it's about 50-50. <laughs> well, well, uh, I, I think you know, the, the way we ask those questions is very important. I, I'm always skeptical of the word immortality or living uh, forever. What I usually like to say is, would you like to live an extra 30 to 50 years? Because, and here's the, here's the issue with the vintage car, which I, I don't subscribe to at all. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised Aubrey said that. He said uh, that, yes. <laughs> The issue at hand here is in 25 years, you're not going to come to a building to listen to Brain Bar anymore. That, that your physical form and all these other things are going to substantially start changing over the next 15 to 20 years because we're going to have microchips that are so powerful they completely revolutionize the way we use technology. We're going to have CRISPR technology. You've already heard of this. People, I have friends that are trying to grow all sorts of things. They're trying to put DNA into their body so they never need to eat anymore and they can go out to the sun and get pure energy and that's the way that they get, keep their body going. I have friends that want to put a third eye in the back of their head. We're approaching an age, and we've already had some success with animals having heavier muscles and things like this um, in China when where they have more of the ability to do some of these experiments. But the kinds of technology we have are going to allow us to be dinosaurs or to fly or to become fish and swim 100 meters underwater in probably 15 to 20 years. And maybe I'm optimistic, but no matter what happens in 25 to 35 years, so the idea of a vintage car, we're not, the car concept is going to die. It's going to go the way of the dinosaurs unless we recreate it. So the idea is we can become almost any type of either biological or machine type of entity we want with our consciousness, with the memories we have. This is all in the next 25 to 50 years. I'm quite certain of it when you look at the trajectory of how quickly this technology... This is the morphological freedom. I so guess. yeah, and this is why we delivered a transhumanist bill of rights 
relates to the US Capitol is because we already are at an age when we have computers that are acting about the equivalent of a 10-year-old, you know, when you ask it questions. So probably in five years, we might have the equivalent of a 15-year-old. And very certainly, probably within 15 years, we could have an artificial intelligence that's smarter than everyone in this room. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's very possible at this point we'll have it. So what do we do when we have another species that's more intelligent than everyone in this room? Well, obviously we have to give it some rights. We don't want to enslave it. I mean, or maybe we do. I mean, these are questions society has to grapple with. In fact, it's all part of the transhumanist platform because a lot of my platform is not actually even putting out um, ideas or regulations of what I want or policy, it's really about putting out questions and trying to get everyone to debate these things so society can move forward in a way that's cohesive. But the one thing I want to say is, if in 25 years you think you're going to be in the same body or in 50 years, uh, I, I, I definitely don't think that. I think we're all going to have multiple different functional, either biological things going on or cyborg things going on or machine parts or even the possibility of uploading our consciousness into machines. And I can assure you that every single industry I just talked to you about um, is already a billion dollar industry where I'm from in San Francisco. There are people working on uploading your brain right now in Silicon Valley. And so, so, so let's, let's, let's run with this for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, pa pause for breath. You can sue him if that's not true. I mean. <laughs> it's true. I, there's, a, there's a number of companies doing on each one of those things. So, so um, I mean, there, there are kind of various questions, ethical questions around this, but let's run with it a little bit. Um, Steve, I, I know you've spoken in the past about, um, uh, about kind of thinking what we as humans would look like in 100 years if we, if we, can, if we pursued this line of thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, mean can, you, can you kind of try and paint look, a picture uh, of this? My view about this is that what Zoltan is saying is broadly speaking correct in terms of the direction of travel, you might say, for humanity. So I think that's basically correct. I think the issue is how fast it happens and whether there will be obstacles along the way. So this might not happen necessarily. I mean, I know the, the, the pitch is it will happen within our lifetime. I'm not so sure. There could be all kinds of political and economic obstacles posed against it. Um, and, and so that could delay it, and maybe even delay it quite considerably. But I do think, you know, assuming we don't annihilate each other, what Zoltan is describing is the direction of travel for humanity, morphological freedom. I do think that's true. I think the problem that that raises then uh, at a political and economic question, uh, at a political and economic level, and it's not too early to ask this question of policymakers and politicians, is what, how, how uh, capable will ordinary individual people be to access the various capacities that are going to be coming on on board? Okay, I mean, uh, at you know, from what Zoltan is saying, right? When Zoltan says you can do this, you can do that, you can do the other thing. He's imagining someone who has quite a lot of discretionary power and perhaps quite a lot of money, okay? And, and the thing is, we still live in a society where there's a massive amount of inequality, uh, and, and, and those inequalities do tend to get exacerbated the more new technologies get introduced, right? Because the haves and the have-nots, you know, the early adopters versus those who have to straggle behind gets larger and larger. And transhumanism as a movement, generally speaking, has been about the early adopters. That's really what the movement is focused on. And you're supposed to imagine yourself as an early adopter, basically, okay? Um, and what there isn't a, a really coherent understanding of is what happens to the rest of humanity, the people who have to be pulled up in some kind of way. Because we've already seen with regard to uh, development aid and the way that's been, ha has had a very checkered career. We're raising people out of poverty in an ordinary kind of sense. That, that hasn't been completely successful either. And so in a sense, this potentially could exaggerate the differences between the haves and the have-nots. And so that's, you know, and so that I think is the question that transhumanism needs to deal mm. with to be a truly political and eco uh, credible political and economic movement that can attract a really broad constituency across the entire political and economic spectrum. Zoltan, class war between the augmented and the non-augmented, um, between we have uh, two classes of humans, the iPhones and the Androids. <laughs> uh, where, I mean, wh I mean wh what is your, you must have thought about this, what's your response? Uh, of course, and you know, I gotta be, we, there's two central questions that always come up with transhumanists. And the first is, well, if everyone lives indefinitely, what are we going to do with an overpopulated planet? And so we can answer that one later. But 
The second one is, what do we do to keep the rich from enslaving all the others or making it so this, we live in some kind of dystopia where uh, the haves and have-nots has gotten bigger? Well, to begin with, my platform endorses um, a universal basic income. I completely uh, can tell you all in this room that if in 20 years, 50% of you uh, still have your jobs and robots haven't taken it, I would be completely surprised. Uh, my wife is a surgeon. She trained for 19 years in OBGYN, and they told her at a recent conference that there will be robots delivering babies better than you in 20 years. You need to prepare for this. And that robot will work 24 hours a day. Um, so no matter what field it is, especially I'm a journalist as well, um, there's no question that journalists will be replaced in seven to 10 Dance. years. I mean, Dance. they're already aggregating machines out there um, that are putting news together. You can see it happening. The idea, though, is what does society do when everyone loses their job because of software, robots, and machines? Well, we need to create a transition to that society. I think that society can be wonderful because then everyone will have free time to do whatever they want. It's not like they don't want, they can't work if they don't want to. They still can. They just not, may not be able to compete against some of the other robots or machines out there. But they could have a ton of free time. But it's one of the reasons why I support a universal basic income. I think if we're going to have robots take people's jobs, Jobs. We need to create more equality in society by giving everyone a certain amount of money every month that allows them to have food, shelter, housing, whatever. On top of that, people can do whatever they want. So this is the way that I address this growing inequality problem. But I see it as well. And I'm, I tend to, you know, even though I subscribe to some libertarian ideas, um, my campaign is mostly centric. It's not really left or right. It's just right down the middle. And the last thing I want to be doing is in 25 years, see a dystopian society because I advocated for robots to uh, come and, uh, you know, and take over the planet. So I want to make sure that humans end up having very happy existences no matter what happens. But again, bear in mind that it's not going to be robots versus humans. We're already developing all these neurotechnologies. So as soon as you get an artificial intelligence or a machine, we're going to start integrating ourselves with it. And you can already see this. There are many people out there that have bionic arms. Well, the newest bionic arms can feel. They have like 50 different types of senses on their fingers, and they connect to your neural system. It's a matter of about 5, 10, maybe 15 years at the most before that robotic arm can throw a football a mile versus your arm, which can throw it 50 yards everyone's gonna start doing upgrades. So at some point, the job market's gonna reflect this as well. But whatever happens, I do think if robots take jobs, we need to give people some type of income so that they can go on and do whatever they want. And for a lot of people, that might be great because you could attend uh, events like this all day long, or you could go to the Bahamas and learn the guitar and drink margaritas. You know, I could, you could write books like me, so maybe, uh, maybe all, this- All in virtual reality while sitting at home. Yeah, yeah, maybe this, this kind of world where people don't work would be kind of the ideal of a utopian society. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first question is who would pay for universal basic income, uh, given that it would, you know, especially if you think about the, uh, the rate at which te new technology is replacing jobs, so I don't disagree with Zoltan on the general prognosis, uh, but who exactly is going to be paying for the universal basic income? I suppose it would be the people who are responsible for replacing the jobs, right? So, uh, you know, all of those great artificial intelligence-based companies that we are lauding so much will, in fact, have to carry the tax burden for this. Uh, and, of course, as you know, they're largely in the business of trying to escape paying taxes. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, there is a political issue here, right? There's a kind of serious political issue about how exactly do you make universal basic income a reality. Uh, and, and, and the other question that arises uh, with regard to Zoltan's rhetoric, which, which in a way is very uplifting and, and is very much utopian in, in the classical sense, namely, he's supposing we're, you know, everyone is part of the we, okay? When we talk about we, right, that he's talking about that, we're gonna, that there's going to be a genuine interest on the part of those, perhaps, who have made their income from being able to make life easier for people by enabling them not to have to hold jobs, to then pay in to enable all of those people to then live a basic decent existence, right? That's the assumption here, right? That the we is a very comprehensive sense of we that includes even those people who could today's governments have a hard enough time trying to keep track of, right? That is to say, the people at the poverty level. 
Okay, the people who, in a sense, are already earning very little, and governments, especially in neoliberal regimes, have a very hard time actually trying to provide anything for. We're now imagining a world where, after even still more jobs are being taken away, th there will be a kind of efflorescence of benevolence that will want to give more money through taxes to people. Okay, the point is, I think, in a sense, the the, the, the one big problem for your vision of transhumanism, which to a large extent I share, I believe in the universal we, just like you seem to do. But I think the real problem is we, don't, we no longer live in a world where the universal we can be taken for granted. Okay? We may have lived in such a world when both of us were kids, when the welfare state was supreme and socialism still had a half-life. Right, But in this world, I don't think there is this kind of comprehensive universal sense of we. And that's something that transhumanism, if it really wants to kind of live up to what you're talking about, will have to reinvent. Because yeah, Zoltan, I mean, it's, it strikes me that in, in general, to Steve's point, we, we are perhaps in danger of getting a little ahead of, ahead of ourselves on this stage. I mean, people have come up with um, hu kind of human transforming technologies before, uh, steroids. EPO, something like that, and it's not as if everyone's rushing out to take them. Similarly, there have been humanity-threatening technologies before, nuclear weapons. But instead of transforming humanity, there's just been a sort of conservative compromise. Isn't it more likely that we're going to see something pretty much like today in the future, rather than a, a very different vision? Well, I, I think I, I sort of disagree with um, this idea that technology has not made that um, you know, fundamentally changed everything. Actually, when you look at a lot of the reports out of the World Bank over the last 30 years, every single improvement, and we've been, we're living almost twice as long from the 1900s, um, the mortality rate has just dropped off. You know, nobody died, very few people lose ch children anymore uh, through birth, I mean, even, even in the developing world. So the, the idea is technology and science, uh, you know, Children are vaccinated all around the world, whether through nonprofits or governments. So we've eradicated various diseases, polio and whatnot, and those kinds of things. We are on the, you know, we have as a, as a species improved through science and technology, specifically through science and technology, not because we're better at democracy, not because we're better at getting along with each other. We have improved because science and technology is available to us as a species and we take it, we, we use it. And the, the same thing, you know, why is democracy uh, proliferating? Well, it has a huge amount to do with the internet. It doesn't have so much to do with the idea that democracy is that much better than another socialist system. It just has to do with information transferring itself because everybody around the planet now uses the internet, or all, most people use it. So specifically, you know, technology and science, the more you create of it, Historically, the better the planet has done, the better the species has done. So while I understand that certain technologies have done harm and certain things haven't helped as much, um, as a rule, we have been moving forward because of science and technology. So I would continue to advocate, even if there are things that are, are frightening about the future. So on that, all technology um, creates progress, even if that technology creates climate change or, for example, if it's, if it's species threatening in the case of nuclear weapons. I mean, isn't, isn't, the role of, isn't the role of a regulator to find a safe way forward by managing these technologies? Well, I mean... Rather so than, as, you know, cause I, as, as I understand it, the, the proposal is to, to let, it, let it go, let everyone do what they want. Well, uh, you know, I, I, don't sub I definitely don't subscribe to the idea of let everyone do what they want. I'm, I'm kind of... So I lean a little bit left, so I do think we need regulations, but let's take the environmental issue because it's such a huge one for overpopulation. And my campaign and the Transhumanist Party, we all believe in global warming. We believe that the planet's becoming overpopulated. I spent uh, five years working at National Geographic. I saw the destruction of rainforests. But what a lot of people didn't realize, so for example, I was a director at a wildlife organization called Wild Aid for two uh, years, and we worked in Southeast Asia stopping poaching. And we were trying to save the endangered species with military people basically hunting poachers and stopping them that way. Well, it turns out here in a couple years, and we already have this technology to some extent, we're not gonna stop poaching. What we're gonna do is replenish um, endangered species in a laboratory bring them to Cambodia, bring them to Vietnam, bring them to Thailand, and let out 5,000 tigers in the wild. That's the way to bring back a species. And it's much more cost efficient, and it's a lot less labor intensive than going out there. So you're going to do that for poor people in Africa too, right? 
Well, you can do that for, for technology. Right, that's the idea, right? You could do that for, for all the kind of people, you know, all the people who will be in danger, who are endangered by stuff like that. You'll bring them back to life. This is the transhumanist pro. Rather than actually preventing them from dying, you'll bring them back. You'll resurrect them. Well, no, no. I think I think we were talking <laughs> no, about... No, seriously. No, we're I mean, talking about endangered wildlife. But when it comes to... But what to, about humans? No, well, of course. And, you know, one of the main things of the party is that we would... Uh, try to give as much science and technology and vaccines to anyone around the world. In fact, uh, you know, I subscribe to, one of the main things of the Transhumanist Bill of Rights is we believe there's a universal right to live indefinitely. So we're trying to create the technologies all across the planet so that people can have, you know, when they created the United Nations Bill of Rights, which was in 1948, you know, they put in things like universal education, they put in things like universal, uh, you can't, you know, um, hurt a child, they put in a bunch of different things, um, you know, we're trying to do the same thing with living indefinitely, where a culture as a whole, the species as a whole says, we have the technology now so that every person on the planet does not have to go through the, the suffering of losing a loved one or the suffering of dying. But what, if they, do, what if they don't want this well, option? Well, no, they, they don't need it, but we think that they'll probably want it, just like they probably want the internet. Are you sure? Yeah, I do. I, I think most people will. Uh, I, I actually, well, At least honest, they'll want the choice. I have yet to go I into an audience where actually the majority of people have wanted to live forever, to be well, honest I, with you. I think we've talked about this a lot. I mean, uh, and, 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 and I, I'm just wondering, what do you do with all those people who don't, par partly because they actually can't organize their lives that way. Their lives are organized around mortality. And in fact, that's a very kind of traditional understanding of how humans get meaning for life is by having to face death and as a result, order their priorities. I mean, you would remove the need to do that if you lived forever. You could do anything at any time. Well, we wouldn't remove the need. We would simply say, you have this option now. Do you want to reschedule your priorities differently? I mean, I think everyone in this room probably wants the option. I mean, it, it, having the option is like, you know, having that, uh, that way out in case you want. I'm not saying everyone in the room would want, want it. But doesn't want the option and feels that their humanity is actually tied to their mortality? Well, some people are definitely like that. And we're always going to say to those that, hey, you, you know. Do you put them in a reservation or do you allow them to interact with the immortalists? <laughs> no, no, because this is going to be a serious issue if transhumanism becomes a real political activity. What is going to be the relationship between the people who are interested in living forever, and those who, who in a sense, accept the Humanity 1.0 vision of the well, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which does presuppose people die eventually. Well, I think it'd be just like vaccines or just like medicine. Anyone in this room has the opportunity to Not refuse. vaccines. In vaccines, people are mandated to have them, right? Well, no. In, this is the big de debate in California sure, yeah, right now. No, a lot mandated. of kids, in fact, where my kids go to school, they don't have to do it yet. That's, it's been a big contentious subject in California. But I think I would insist that everybody has the option to do exactly what we want. Because I think morphological freedom carries over to the point when people want to die or don't want to die. Everyone should always have the option, and reservations, absolutely not. I think people will just get along, and there'll be those who <laughs> want to live longer and those who don't. And also, you have to understand How about not... job replacement? Well, well, you know, some uh, guy who's just carrying on like a vintage car indefinitely, <laughs> right? Well, we're going to let. It's holding that professorial <laughs> chair till he's 95. By the way, I'm 102. Uh, you know, I mean, what happens to all the younger people? The academic job market is. is is at the moment completely demolished because you got all these old people who are living forever, keeping their jobs. Well, that's final, capitalism. Final response, and then we have some questions. <laughs> no, no, no but, that, but that's a problem. You got to. I mean, that's just one of many problems down the road for this. But has the academic movement been hurt because of that? I think the young people have certainly. Maybe that's one of the reasons why a lot of them are in this audience. To be honest with you, it's had a spillover effect. Okay. Okay. And so, <laughs> and so on that note, to the audience. Do you, do you have any questions? Let's, uh, can we put the light? Oh, there's, there's a question here at the front. Can we bring the lights up maybe? So we, so yeah, we, can, so we see. can see somebody. <laughs> right, quick, short questions, I, uh, please. I got Thanks. two questions. Uh, okay, one, I mean, one question. Besides the demand of, uh, of life insurance companies, uh, I think they have to think uh, that's about uh, for uh, Steve. Uh, it's about the ship of uh, Theseus. Uh, you know the... The, Greek the hero. ship of Theseus, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, when you're replacing your body and your mind uh, piece by piece, then probably you will get someone else. So your whole self or the notion of yourself will become someone else. So I don't think that the threat that you said that uh, people will live forever as professors and don't let young uh, minds and young ideas come into place 
is kind of not a real threat because uh, you, they will become newer and their, f uh, their, their mind will change as well. So, okay, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. so and also <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. We, we've got, we we got to stick to, no? to one question. Let's, uh, are, there, are there questions? Go on, Steve, you answer. So let's, let's on, the, on the question of um, is there something inherent to the self that can't well, be Well, look, I mean, I think, I mean, there are a couple of issues that you're raising here. One of them has to do with you know, insofar as we still respect the idea that there are individuals, and, and in a sense, the ship of Theseus example makes us wonder, well, you know, I start off as one kind of being, but then I turn into some other kind of being. Am I the same person? So uh, just, just to explain, he, he was kind of so constantly, he was at sea so long that he was replacing the parts of the boat. Yeah, and so the boat was a totally You know, different. when it arrives, is it the same boat as it was when it left? Uh, yes, exactly. This is what he's alluding yeah. to. Um, and, and of course, that's a real possibility. Um, but I think there's a, there's a, there, there are a couple of issues. One issue has to do, which I think will be a big issue for transhumanism, especially with morphological freedom, is how you ascribe responsibility of people for actions, especially if they're given an enormous amount of latitude for changing themselves, right? So you say, that's just my former self that committed that murder, not me. That's just my avatar that committed that murder, not me, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's gonna be a lot of problems with that because the continuity of consciousness over time which is you know, the forensic legal definition of what a person is, could easily be shattered by transhumanism. And while that might seem to be liberating, it makes everyone then unaccountable. But the other point with regard to the employment issue is, look, in so, you know, if you are concerned about successive generations, people who have not yet had a chance to live full lives, space has to be made for them. I think on the transhumanist picture, it is just assumed that space is kind of infinite. Right, that people will always find a place to explore and to expand and to be. But insofar as we live in a finite world where it is important for people to carry on in certain specific kind of jobs, the need for replacement is a significant one. And I don't think transhumanism uh, addresses that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, right, um, uh, let's I have a question. Thank you. Yeah, um, let's try and take uh, questions in uh, a set of three questions sure. this time, and then, then we can kind of get more, more responses. Lady okay, real quick, my question would be, do you think that transhumanism has the potential to make consciousness eternal, or do you believe consciousness is eternal? Okay, consciousness. Well, yeah, uh, hang on, hang on, let's, let's get some more oh, questions, okay. and then we can fit. Sure. So, uh, so do, you, do you want to ask a question? Oh, okay, great. Oh, hey. perfect. Right here. Yep. Uh, so the, my question is, do you support cryogenics or not? Because it's closely related to this discussion, I think. Okay, so that's uh, consciousness, cryogenics, and lady at the front. Uh, don't you think we should work on preserving what we already have, for example, the environment, rather than, that, rather than working on developments in other fields that aren't really necessary? So consciousness, cryogenics, and preservation. Zoltan, choose between them. Sure. Well, let me go for the consciousness one because, uh, you know, this is fascinating. I think about this all day long. So, you know, one of the main things about my um, presidential campaign is I'm kind of known as, I think, historically the first... Uh, atheist presidential candidate in the United States, we live in a very religious country in America where like 75% of people are religious. However, a lot of the youth is beginning to become less religious or more agnostic. That said, I, I just say that for kind of rebellious reasons, whether I really believe whether there's a higher power or not is, is very difficult to say. One thing's for sure, we know that there's approximately one trillion um, galaxies out there. And we know that there are approximately 500 billion stars and planets in each galaxy. And recently NASA reported that they think there's upwards of 10 billion habitable planets in our galaxy alone. So the real number is one trillion times 10 billion is the amount of habitable planets you have in the universe. Given the universe is 14 billion years old, it's an incredibly high probability that there are not just species or aliens or other types of consciousness out there, but there are billions and billions and billions of them out there. And as Elon Musk said yesterday, it, or recently, it's very possible we're all living in the matrix. So when we talk about consciousness, I have seen, you know, I used to be a, 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 a war correspondent for National Geographic. I've seen death, uh, people disintegrate, people die, there's nothing left. You can poke them all day long, even a year later, they're just bones. So my, what I see is that the consciousness has disappeared. Whether there's something beyond, there's something ethereal, that's an incredibly much more complex question that so far the human mind has not been able to answer. But I wouldn't be surprised if there is something that um, through, you know, astro dust or whatever that can be preserved and re goes through some type of other reality. But for now, I'm going to stick with the idea that consciousness ends when people die. And that's part of why the transhumanist platform oh, is so powerful is because 
it can give eternal life. And in a way, it's almost a religion in that matter, though I don't like to look at it. It's a kind of a secular uh, philosophy, but it is something that the number one goal of transhumanism is to use science and technology to make it so people don't have to die, so their consciousness can always be preserved. But, but Steve, I mean, until well, the aliens arrive... Are we going to get to the other two questions as well? Yes, yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. But I, this question, yes, let's talk about yeah, it. Yeah, because but until the aliens arrive, or it's suddenly revealed that we are indeed in the Matrix, shouldn't we worry more about preserving what we've got and putting our energies into being nice to each other and accepting the fact that we're all going to die? I don't see the problem of consciousness this way at all. I'm a little surprised how you ended the, the, the little discussion you just had. Um, uh, my, my view is actually that consciousness is something that could be continued in many multiple different kinds of media and could actually, I mean, I think of consciousness a bit like a musical score that could be mixed with others as well, actually. And so that one could, as it were, merge consciousnesses, let's say, in a board-like fashion, you know? I mean, I, I, I sort of... You know, so, so I'm kind of liberal on this point, maybe more liberal than you are, that, that in a sense, the fact that there's a particular stream of memories that emanate from one body in a given period of time is a pretty contingent fact that could exist in some other kind of medium in combination with other kinds of consciousnesses, other kinds of streams of memories in some subsequent incarnation. So in that respect, I'm very... This is one, where, one place where I think morphological freedom could actually make some great inroads into our understanding of consciousness. But, so but I'm a little bit more liberal than you, it seems to me, on this point. Because I don't have a <laughs> proprietary, I don't have such a proprietary notion of consciousness as you have. But on the, but on the practical question then that was raised, I mean, are, are we spending uh, a, a, kind of a stupid amount of time thinking about this stuff and debating it when we could be getting on making other people's lives better in, in the everyday? Well, well, let me go to the, the question, the last question that was yeah. raised by the person who was concerning, concerned about preserving species and so forth. Um, I mean, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a point well taken, and I think, I think one way to think about transhumanism, if you want to really get into the mindset of it, is, uh, and this maybe explains why a lot of people attracted to transhumanism also seem to be attracted to kind of apocalyptic versions of science fiction, is you're sort of thinking always about what needs to be kept around assuming the worst possible situation where almost everything's obliterated, okay? So what you're talking always, you know, so resurrection is on the table, right? Because you're imagining everything's going to be dead or transformed or changed or, right? There's going to be this vast kind of dynamic metamorphosis taking place. And so the key question then is, how can you get the stuff back that you really think is important? And so this business about resurrecting species that Zoltan was referring to, I think fits into that kind of category, right? Namely, that, that in a sense, we don't have to worry too much about whether we obliterate the planet because we can re-engineer it all over again, or maybe on some other planet, right? So as it, long as we know how to do it. It's a bit like having a gun in your drawer just in case someone robs your house. Yeah, but, but the point is you have to think about what, what are the important things that you would need to preserve to re create. So you'd want the bank account intact. Okay. Right. And so having the DNA is like having the bank account intact, even though somebody bombs your house, you still have the bank account. And so you can then rebuild your house. I think this is kind of the way transhumanists think about the world. And then the question is, wouldn't it be better just to stop people bombing houses? Well, exactly. In I this, mean, I think this, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So that's, a, that that's the logic, so. except if the global warming thing is out of control in the way in which the most, you know, the most apocalyptic people who are talking about global warming uh, are, are saying, then it does make a lot of sense now to try to figure out ways in which we can incorporate what is valuable about life on Earth and potentially in a way that could be transported to another planet. So, so in a sense, I'm not against this idea of resurrection and all that kind of stuff, because if it turns out that the Earth is doomed, then how are we going to continue living? It's not too early to think about what that would involve. And so the preservation of DNA and and the preservation of information that can be used in other places far from Earth, that is very much, I think, on the table, and that's a reasonable thing to do. But it shouldn't necessarily be, you know, kind of what we expect will necessarily happen. But I do think there is this kind of doom mentality that transhumanism is preoccupied with. So, I mean, I, I'd love to get more into this, but I think yeah. we should get some more questions. Um, well, let me there was a question about, about cryogenics. Yes, yes, yes. don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, me, yeah just, but just quickly on cryogenics, because then I think we'll have time for one sure. more set of questions. Cryogenics is where you freeze your body after it's died in hopes that medical technology will bring it back. And um, I am a complete proponent of cryogenics, uh, cryonics, which we also call it. And um, I think almost every transhumanist is. It's a core part of transhumanism, especially for the older crowd who actually has to worry about dying here. Um, most people my age, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm 43, will not have to worry 
about going into a, a cryonics chamber ever because we will have the technologies to keep us alive in, in definitely, I think. But um, if you're uh, you know, 60 years old or above, you're definitely gonna have to uh, worry about it. So it's a huge field. I've been to many different cryonics companies and they're, they're really actually fascinating. And I'm sure we're gonna be bringing people back here in the next 25 to 35 years, or at least we're gonna start attempting it. Um, so they've had some success uh, with animals. So, uh, on cryonics, let me just get on cryonics here because I okay, don't have but anything. We, but we do want to have time for more questions. <laughs> no, because people who are interested in transhumanism are interested in cryonics. There's no doubt about it. It's very but, much but, but all the next questions might not be about cryonics. Uh, well, anyway, sorry, no, and then we can preempt them. I mean, uh, <laughs> but the thing is that the, I think the thing about cryonics is that it, in a sense, it's very fascinating and it's kind of easy to explore because legally speaking, you're dead when it happens. Right, so in a sense, all of the all the ethical kind of restrictions that normally are involved in research involving genetics and all the other things that might prevent dying aren't in place because you're legally dead. And so there's this hope that's invented, that's invested uh, on the part of the of the cryonics people that you will be resurrected in some way once we know the relevant medical technology. So it's a relatively easy thing to do. I would say, as a point of fact, that the amount of space that it takes is pretty much like cemeteries. Right? It takes about as much, if you wanted to actually have the whole population on cryonics because you're waiting for the, the great sort of cure that's going to solve all the problems of disease and you really made it equally available to everyone, you'd be having cemeteries all over the place because it takes about as much space as a cemetery does at the moment. Right? And so the whole point about cryonics is it's, it's only a good investable proposition if you think at some point it won't be necessary. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I it's, it's, it's in my point of view, uh, and it built into the Transhumanist Bill of Rights is promotion of cryonics. It is uh, just a safeguard for the entire transhumanist community right now for people who die. I mean, there's a couple other safeguards. People try to download their social media and have that run indefinitely. I, the people at Terrasum shoot out these things called mind files out into space, hoping it gets regurgitated. There's a number of different methods, but cryonics is the, the, the closest thing we have right now for transhumanists when they die to know that they have a very solid shot at least of being brought back or at least attempting to bring them back. And there's no question that the technology is going to will, work. Will you be frozen? Yes, 100%. Okay. 100%. Um, so I think we've got time for two more questions. Do we? Yes. Okay, two more questions. I, I, uh, um, yeah, I, okay, okay, right. Here. Hands, so hands. Yeah, here. Okay. Oh, you've got the mic already. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zoltan, do you think that uh, uh, technology can lead us to an era where uh, people uh, can reach their desires and satisfy their needs without resources. I mean, we, we don't need shelter, we don't need, uh, uh, we don't need uh, food, <laughs> we don't need uh, a sexual partner for sexual satisfaction. And if you believe that can happen, what? What's the timeline you see? Okay, the old. <laughs> sure. The so old. The old. Th this is this is this is such an important question. And how will they contribute to the economy <laughs> if they're like that? Well, this is such <laughs> an important question because I think what one of the things you have to understand is you don't need much of an economy when you're a robot that's able to replicate things from natural yeah. resources. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I advocate for a policy of just completely eliminated ta eliminating taxes. At some point, all governments are going to be run by machines. There's not going to be anybody there, and. The same thing's gonna happen with human beings. Like I said, we have people already trying to use, get um, DNA, splice DNA into their skin so that they can get energy from the sun. We're gonna get rid of our organs. We're not gonna poop anymore. We're not gonna drink wine. We're not gonna eat. I mean, these things are going the way of dinosaurs. It'll take 20 to 30 years, but the, bio the biological system is not efficient. When you look at it, it's actually a horrible system compared to being a machine or being a, a synthetic, uh, a new type of synthetic uh, material that we haven't discovered yet. So we're going to upgrade ourselves slowly over the next 20 or 30 years. And I would be very surprised if people continue to eat beyond 30 or 40 years from now. Eating gives us cancer. Uh, all these different types of things that we do uh, <laughs> is essentially something that we've been, you know, we think that's what we need to do, but no, we can get energy from so many different ways. Just like we're getting our cars to have new types of energies, we're all gonna be integrated into machines. And the same thing's gonna happen with shelter. You're not gonna need shelter in the same way. And of course, regarding partners, marriage, no one's gonna get married in 30 or 40 years. You're not gonna get married if you're gonna be married for 10,000 years. I mean, you're going to think differently <laughs> on that. And the same thing with children. Are you, if you're going to live, if you're going to live a thousand years. Why would years, you have children if you're going to live for 10,000 years? Of course. And would you have them the first hundred or 200 years? And by the time that time comes, I mean, the world's going to be so different. So every institution that you have today 
uh, they're going the way of the dinosaurs. They're not going to be around. But in unless 20 or you 30 get years. somebody to pay for the taxes for the universal basic income, this isn't going to happen. So you have to the, the, before you can get to the tax-free world, you have to have somebody paying taxes up front for the for the basic yeah, income. Yeah, but if you're right? a machine yeah. that can make your own products like 3D printing, I mean, we're pro probably about half of us will have a 3D printer in our house within 10 years' time, where you're able to recreate things, including your arm that you put on through your neural system. So, so, Zoltan, is, is any of this disprovable? I mean, if <laughs> <laughs> if, if, in, if in 30 years' time... You'll all be dead, but that will falsify you, won't it? <laughs> well, if you're all dead when it happens, you will be falsified, well, yeah, but I no mean, one will know it. I mean, because I guess you know, anyone who spends any time around tech has a lot of in 10 years predictions. And I'm pretty sure 10 years ago we were told that there would be 3D prints in every house then. So, I mean, is there, is, is there a point when you say, actually, I'm not sure any of this is really going to happen... Well, T time you to know, let, let's be honest, as a futurist, I'm optimistic, and I could be wrong by 30%, let's say, but, um, you know, I don't <laughs> think I'm wrong by, let's say, 100%. I'm pretty sure that if we all come back in 30 years, we are, a lot of us are going to have cyborg parts built into us. Some of us will probably already not really have to worry about death. The real question, though, that I think has been important in this entire debate is the social equality. Who funds the kinds of transformation in society? But I do believe, no matter how we look at it, the tech is here. You can be off by 10 yeah, years, but the right tech, about, the tech right is coming. The I see it in Silicon Valley. You would not believe the things people are doing. I mean, this CRISPR technology that we're on is, is just is going to revolutionize. I mean, we might be able to re-engineer ourselves out of cancer, out of heart disease here in 10 or 15 years. They're already in China working on trying to get it so they can augment their children's intelligence. And this is an incredible yeah. political question yeah, because yeah, yeah. what if China allows their babies to be augmented by 15 or 20 percent higher IQs than Americans, but Americans who's very religious don't? Or I don't know how, what the Hungarian government would say, but the point of the story is if some country does it first and the new generation is 20 percent smarter, that's a, that's a hard thing to deal with. So again, this is why all these conversations are very important. We're dealing with technology that's here and experiments are already taking place. They've already started to mess with the human genome. Yeah. So I think we've got time for one last set of questions. Um, let's, let's try and have, there's a lot of blokes with hands in the air. Can we uh, try and have uh, some gender equality in the questions, please? Yeah, I know, sorry, I, I can't. We can't <laughs> really <laughs> see you, which makes it harder. Th there's a there's um, a, gr uh, a girl oh, in blue right yeah, well, there. Well, I mean, who's oh. who's who's got the? Ah, okay, yes. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, oh well, 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 go on, sir. Ask ask your question. Then we let's have let's have two more after that, and so then we will then we will wrap up. You hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, so if we can be whatever we want to be, then uh, what makes us human? What makes us human? Good question. Uh, two more questions. Let's, let's see some hands. Uh. Does it? Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for the gender equality <laughs> remark. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, this question. Um, I'm curious, uh, preserving human intelligence, you know, um, makes sense because we want to uh, accumulate more knowledge, for example. But we, at the moment, we're not even using 100% um, of the knowledge that we have. I mean, just that you talk, uh, mentioned gender equality. Women, the largest untapped market. So, um, so in terms of future progression, I think you know, that's going to be the first, that we're going to have to utilize everything that we actually have and then preserve something. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And oh, they, they, got, they got a little round of applause for that one. Um, and then finally, a question. He's got the mic. So I think, I think it's on already. Yeah. Uh, there were talks about artifi uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, how, would you, how would you solve the ownership problem? So does the developer own the artificial intelligence or not? Yes, good question. Um, so uh, what was that? That was um, what makes us human? Uh, the question of gender equality, and then finally, I mean, h who's making this this stuff? And Sh sure. you know, the I mean, you've got a chip, and you do you own the chip completely? It's being made by yeah. someone. For you Questions of ownership. Sure, a lot of you don't know, but I have a chip. I can do things like start my car with this. Um, I can do things like give you my business card if you have the software on your phone. And um, the next generation will allow you to pay at Starbucks. So uh, I think everyone's going to get a chip. It's the size of a grain of rice. But let's start off with the humanity question, because it's a question I get a lot. He had asked, um, 
basically, how are we going to avoid losing our humanity? Well, I think the key is, the real question is, is humanity always a good thing? And, you know, given that we've had a number of world wars and um, human beings aren't always that nice to each other, there certainly are some bad qualities that I would be willing to lose as a human being as we kind of become a transhumanist or a transhuman being. So, but I do want to keep the very best qualities. Being a mammal has been very good in terms of love and, and you know, wanting to be near each other and communication and being a, a kind of what I might call a, a, a social hive. Um, and I think in the chip implant age, which is coming soon, we have about a half million people around the world that have a brain implant already. Most of it's for fighting disease, but we're going coming to a point when a lot of the implant technology is going to, uh, just like some of the headsets you may have seen that deal with brainwave activity, can connect directly to our thoughts. So we could be directly connected to each other's thoughts. This idea of telepathy has been around for two years and is already a multi-billion dollar industry in Silicon Valley. So at some point we may be giving speeches without actually talking, but thinking things. But the idea of our hum losing our humanity is something that I think is okay to a certain extent as long as we keep the very best parts. And regarding gender equality, such a massive issue in the transhumanist community, which is dominated by white males, and just upsets me again and again. It's been incredibly difficult, even on my campaign, to try to get more diversity and more women um, involved in the sciences, involved in technology. I think a lot of what I'm talking about seems kind of crazy to a lot of people. So I think women are oftentimes more reasonable than men, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they haven't subscribed so much to transhumanism. But I'm, I haven't, I, one of my policies on my campaign is that I would like to force the United States government to have 50% women serve in office and 50% men, and not allow it to be 85% and 15%, which is what it is right now. So um, it's one of my kind of controversial policies that we would create a law that would force it at least every four years to, for example, have a, uh, a female president, and in Congress as well, especially in Congress, to mandate that the, the genders and the sexes are more distributed equally. I think it'd be a lot better for peace on planet Earth to have a lot more women in charge. That's just my uh, personal opinion. I'm married to a, uh, a kind of a, a surgeon and she's a very strong woman who's at the front lines of the women's rights movement. And um, I can let you answer if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, mean, because there was also the question of ownership as well. Yeah, I don't know about the ownership issue. I mean, that's, I will leave that to someone who actually has some money and some skin in the game. I don't. <laughs> but, but I think with regard to the, 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 the two, the first two questions with regard to human, what is human and, and, uh, and the extent to which we uh, neglect. And I think you weren't just talking about gender, but you were talking about a large amount of, of human knowledge that's neglected. I think that's par for the course in human history, okay? Um, so the kinds of issues that Zoltan has just been highlighting has been very much part of how humanity has kind of come to terms with the kind of being that it is. And I think in a way, historically, the easiest way for humanity to think about in terms of what is the wheat and the chaff, as it were, right? What is it that we want to keep and promote about who we are and what is it that we want to leave behind? Historically, the easiest way to think about this, and it's not the way that secular culture does, it, but was to think that you know we're part God, part animal, right? And the animal part is holding us back, right? The animal part is what makes us mortal, it's what, 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 what makes us short-sighted, it's what makes us respond to immediately to things, uh, and that we need is this kind of global, comprehensive, universal kind of perspective that God has. And in some sense, we might have had that in the beginning, if you believe in the Abrahamic religions, but we sort of lost it through original sin or something like that. And so the question is then, how do you put it back together? And that's what the struggle of being human is about. Well, if you don't have that narrative anymore because you're an atheist or you're secular in some kind of way, then there's a real live question that we live with now, even if we're not transhumanists, of what it is to be human, okay? Because the fact of the matter is we have left a lot of the actual human experience and condition behind as not being relevant and not being important. Uh, and, 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 you know, the history of subjugation is all about that. Uh, and, and the question is, how does transhumanism, as it were, make this problem better, or does it make it worse? Because I do think the struggling for what we are as a, as a, as a being, as a, as a human, and who we want to include in who we take forward is very much an open question. So again, we could talk about that we, you know, that there are certain good things about being human and certain things that aren't. But again, when you think about who is the we who's the subject of this sentence, we're probably not talking about everyone on the planet. We're just talking about a certain group of like-minded people who are able to participate in a conversation like this. 
but, but the questions potentially have a much greater power and scope than we often are willing to acknowledge. And that's why I think that even if people don't um, buy into all of the more exotic claims of transhumanism, that nevertheless this is probably the movement that in the most explicit way brings to the fore the question of what is good about he being human that we want to take forward in the future. And on that note, well, should we answer very quickly the... the uh, yeah, if you have the ownership... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 just, just very quickly, because yes. we're, we're, you can Look, see we're taking down time. The Transhumanist Bill of Rights was entirely about this ownership I issue. It's this idea of sapient beings. Um, we are at the point when, you know, you may have seen the videos, you, they create them at Google, where people are starting to kick robots. Um, we have, you know, there's a, a $100 million robot sex industry out there. At what point when a robot says, I don't want to be raped, or at what point when a robot says, I feel pain? And we, we're creating robots now that feel pain. Um, when you see robots being kicked, you know something wrong is happening. So I think that's when we start talking about ownership. When a machine tells you, I want my freedom, we need to say, you can have it as long as you can take care of yourself and you're not a child anymore. So we're coming to that age. I would say within seven to 12 years, they're going to have to rewrite a whole bunch of the different rules for what it means to be a living entity. It's no longer just a human being. It's going to be a sapient being which is a being that has an advanced intelligence. And the same thing's gonna be happening with some of the new creatures they're trying to create with genetics. Um, we're going to be creating intelligent creatures. They are trying to grow brains right now in laboratories. They're going to be successful in 10 or 15 years. And um, if those brains feel pain and they can tell it to you, you need to, you, you should take, our, we should continue down our mammalian road and be nice human beings and give them rights and protect those rights. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Zoltan and Steve, thank you. Thank you.